Well, we're going to be continuing with our study of Acts this morning, and this morning we're going to be looking at the account in Acts 24. I'd encourage you to follow along in your Bibles. If you're going to use the Pew Bible in front of you, the Acts 24 can be found on page 1105 is where it begins. Acts 24. Before coming here and before going to seminary, I, some of you know, was an attorney and I practiced trial law, and so one of the things that I got used to doing was asking a lot of questions, and so I want to begin this morning by asking a question of you all. Are you prepared to live as moral outlaws for Christ? Are you prepared to live as moral outlaws for Christ? As Jeremy was just mentioning, I'm getting ready to to move to the Middle East to do church planning work and to do gospel work there and see the gospel grow. And so one thing that I've had to consider is what is it going to look like to live in a culture where I will be considered a a moral outlaw, where most people don't even find my views contradictory, but they find them offensive, where people hate the message that I bring and the message that I preach. And, And so I've had to consider what will this look like. And so I'm asking you now to consider what will it look like for you all? What will it look like to live as moral outlaws? Now, outlaw, rebel, dissident, nonconformist, these aren't terms we usually think of when we think about Christians in America traditionally, but I would posit this morning that this isn't your traditional America. In fact, over the last couple of years, American culture has hit a milestone that we should not be proud of. In fact, we've hit a, a disappointing milestone. The, the polling and the statistics are, are a little bit debatable, but most likely, for the first time in American history, the majority of Americans find morally acceptable, morally acceptable these things. Abortion, physician-assisted suicide, divorce, premarital sex, pornography, and same-sex acts. For the first time in American history, the majority of Americans find all of those things morally acceptable. All things that the traditional biblical view of morality has found morally unacceptable. Christians can't consider themselves anymore to be in the moral majority, and we're, we're moving into the moral minority. And the question that we have to ask is, as the pendulum swings and momentum moves us into the moral minority, is how far will it go? I don't have a prophetic answer to that, but I don't think it's unreasonable to think that it's going to continue to swing to where Christians won't only even be a minority, but they'll actually become moral outlaws, where the the views and the morals and the worldview that Christians hold is laughable at best to the majority culture and illegal at worst. In most cases, I assume it will be offensive. So I posit the question to you, are you prepared to live as moral outlaws in America? Fortunately, being a moral outlaw is nothing new to Christianity. As long as Christianity has been around, there has been moral outlaws. And in fact, Over the last few weeks, we've been studying a quintessential moral outlaw in Paul. If you're just joining us, we've been going through the book of Acts, and we're to chapter 24, and and recently this moral outlaw, Paul, who is being opposed by the Jewish moral majority or the majority culture, and, and he traveled to Jerusalem where the Jews stirred up a crowd and a riot around him, and and the Romans, who are actually in authority, arrested him, Lysias the commander, and and they arrested him actually for his protection, and then they found out the Jews were going to kill Paul, so Lysias sends Paul to Felix in Caesarea. And so we find ourselves this morning in Caesarea with Paul as he gets ready to go on trial for the charges that the Jews are bringing against him. It's a a trial, it's the only true trial account in the book of Acts of of Paul. He has several hearings before several officials, but this is the one true Roman procedure that he receives. It's a procedure not that different than American court procedure. 
You're going to see the, the prosecution is going to put on their case and their charges and their accusations against Paul. And then Paul's going to have an opportunity to make his defense. And then the facts are going to go to the trier of fact. And the U.S. is the jury. And here is Felix, the judge. And a verdict will be rendered. So I want us just to walk through the phases of this trial. And as we do, I want us to consider how does Paul approach How does Paul understand being a moral outlaw in this culture? So, verse 1, the prosecution's case. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went up to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. They brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have hoped a long period of peace. We've had a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to worry you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusations, asserting that these things were true. Nothing good happens when you bring the lawyers in. (laughs) So I think I can say that. But I do think the fact that the Jews brought to Tertullus does paint a picture for us of what's going on in this Roman courtroom. You have the Jews who are the majority culture of that day in Judea, and they're presented with Ananias, their leader, and his posse of elders come in, and and they hire Tertullus to make their, their charges. That's on one side of the courtroom, and on the other side of the courtroom is is Paul, who is brought in. It doesn't say anyone else was with Paul. Maybe there were, maybe Luke or some others were there, but, but this picture is painted of, of the moral majority and their power and, and the moral outlaw and his lack of it. And they levy these charges against him. Briefly, I just want to look at the charges that the Jews are charging Paul with. In verses 5 and 6, it's, they, they allege he's a troublemaker. They allege that he's stirring up riots among the Jews. They allege that he's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, and they allege that he attempted to desecrate the temple. Now, it's a Roman courtroom, not a Jewish courtroom, and in a Roman courtroom, all of these charges really amount to one thing, that that Paul was inciting rebellion or or inciting riots. Felix, as a a Roman judge, isn't concerned with sex of the Jews. He's he's not concerned with purification of, of the temple, but he is concerned with peace. And so if it can be found that Paul was was violating peace and causing riots, then he would have the right to hold him in prison or or even kill him. But as good readers of the book of Acts, we already know that Paul is innocent. In fact, Lysias has already told Felix that Paul is innocent. If we remember back from last week in chapter 23, verse 29, Lysias writes a letter to Felix, and he says this, I have found the accusations had to do with questions about their law but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. The real issue here isn't that Paul was causing riots. The real issue is the Jews didn't like him preaching the gospel. The real issue is the Jews didn't like the message that he brought. I think there is a reality we see here that majority culture The moral majority will use cultural institutions to oppose and oppress the moral outlaw. Jews here, who are the majority culture in first century Judea, are using cultural institutions, the Roman courts, to oppose and oppress Paul, the moral outlaw. I don't think this is a first century reality. Moral outlaws are being opposed all over the world. Some of you may recognize the name, Saeed Abedini. He's an American pastor who is in prison right now serving eight years in Iran because he was doing church planting and church organization work there. The, the Muslim majority culture used the legal system, the institution, to oppose Pastor Saeed. But, 
It's not a, a Muslim reality either. Most of you probably haven't heard of Raul Akunj. Raul Akunj is an Indian man. I hope I'm saying his name right. But Raul was opposed by the tribal majority in a, a part of India, and, and the courts took him in and, and charged him with leading a rebel group. That, le- that rebel group was a church. Haung Izi was a leader of the church in China who was arrested for disturbing social order. He was a pastor in a church. It's not just an Eastern reality either. I think it's a growing reality in the West that majority culture will use cultural institutions to oppose the moral outlaw. We see it here. We see as as majority culture continues to align itself with the LGBTQ movement, that the courts are increasingly getting involved. I think of cases in Oregon and in Colorado where bakeries have been brought on charges of discrimination because they refuse to bake cakes for same-sex marriages. But I also don't want us to make the mistake of thinking it's only a legal reality. Majority culture will use whatever institutions they have access to. There's a man in New York City who I know, and I'll call him Richard because he doesn't want his testimony shared, but Richard was working at a high-power firm in, in New York City. He was an executive-level employee, and his board asked him to resign because he was an evangelical Christian, and he was outspoken about his faith. We see it in the, the college campuses today. There's colleges all over this country who are restricting the meeting and gathering and, and having official clubs, Christian clubs, because of discriminatory acts that they accuse us of. Maybe it's happening in your families. Maybe you find yourself as a, a moral outlaw and, and pushed out of your family because of what you believe about Jesus. It's a reality today. And I think it's going to be a growing reality as moral culture continues to press against moral outlaws. So the question remains, how will we respond? Well, how did Paul respond? And so we see the charges that have been brought by the Jewish majority culture. They've charged him with rioting and, and they've rested their case. And so now it's Paul's turn to be heard in the defense case. And, and so we pick up in verse 10. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 years ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges that are now make, they are making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially, ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state that crime they have found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. No lawyer, no posse, no crowd, just Paul making his simple defense. And first we see Paul making denials of the factual claims against him. We see in verse 12, my accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple. He was not rioting or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. He goes on to say that he was ceremonially clean. He wasn't desecrating the temple. Verse 18, 
I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple. Again, I wasn't causing a riot, nor was I involved in any disturbance. Paul is making clear to Felix and to us that he has done nothing wrong under Roman law. I think something we can take from this is as Christians and as moral outlaws, we have the freedom to defend ourselves when we're falsely accused. We don't have any obligations to hide away or to cower away when people bring false accusations against us. And I do assume as moral outlaws, false accusations will be made against the church. We will be called bigots. We will be called simple-minded. We'll be called closed-minded. We'll be accused of discriminating. And I think like Paul, we have a right to defend ourselves on these claims But there are times we'll probably be accused of things as moral outlaws where the claims are true. I assume there's people in the world now who are, who are preaching the gospel and have been arrested for that in countries where it's illegal to preach the gospel. And I, I imagine the only thing to do is to admit. I imagine there's people who are organizing church plants in places where it's illegal to plant churches and have caught and charged, I imagine the only thing to do is to make an admission of what they were doing. I think that's how we keep a good conscience before God. We see even Paul here is making some admissions. It's a good defense strategy. It's not unusual for defendants to make admissions. When I was practicing law, I I defended uh, clients in civil law, not criminal law, but it's a similar idea. And I would often encourage them to, to admit as many things as possible that weren't crucial to the case. It, it makes you seem credible and reliable. Trials are tense moments. The only people who enjoy trials are the lawyers. <laughs> They're the only ones. Talk to someone, if you've had the experience yourself of being in a courtroom, especially as a defendant, but even as a witness, that is, it's a tense moment when you get on the stand and people are accusing you and they're asking you and they're interrogating you and and you have that tension and you feel like you're on attack and so you just want to deny everything and it makes you seem unreasonable. So so making admissions is is a great defense strategy. However, I don't think Paul had in mind a defense strategy when he goes to admit things. I don't think his concern was a great defense strategy. I think his concern was a gospel strategy. Look at his admissions. I admit that I worship God of our fathers as a follower of the way. I admit that I I worship God through Christ. The way here is a way of talking about Christians. I follow the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the Christians That's how I I follow God. That is the one way to follow God. That's the one way to God is through Christ. And and here's what I love what he does. I want you to see this, that, that Paul then takes Christ and he sets Christ right in the middle of the redemptive story. And it's a redemptive story that even the Jews who oppose him agree with in large part. So he takes Christ and puts it right in the middle of the Jewish redemptive story. Verse 14, I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. Paul is saying like you, Jews, I believe all of this. I believe in creation. I believe that creation fell. I believe that God was gracious and called Abraham out of the wilderness and that he he was going to make him and his seed a nation. And And that God came and redeemed that nation from Egypt and set them in the promised land, a land of milk and honey, and that he established the nation there and established a throne in David. It would be an eternal throne. I believe all of that, Paul is saying. I also believe, Jews, that you were continually unfaithful to God and to the covenant and that God brought about curses of the covenant on you and he exiled you in the lands and and that your prophets say you're waiting for a day when, when the nation will be restored. He's saying, I believe all of that. The story arc of the Old Testament. So he believes in the, the first part of the Jewish redemptive story, but he also comes and says, I believe in the, the last part too. Verse 15, I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. The right, uh, resurrection of the righteous and the wicked here is a, is a pointing to the, the end times, that final judgment we hear about. Both Christians and the Jews believe in that, at least the, the Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees who are really influential 
at this time. They believed that there would be a time where God would come as judge and that all humanity from all time would stand before him and be judged and they would be separated, righteous and wicked, wheat from the chaff. The Jews believed that and, and Paul saying, I do too. So I'm, I'm with you in the first and I'm with you in the end, but, but Jews, what you're missing is, is Jesus is your missing middle. Jesus is the cord that ties your beginning and your end together. Don't you see that? Ananias, don't you see that? Tertullus, don't you see that? Felix, don't you see that, that Christ is the necessary middle to the redemptive story? And, and without Christ in the middle, you're in trouble when you get to the end. Christ is the link of the Old Testament to the judgment. Christ is the one that allows someone in good conscience to stand before God on judgment and be declared righteous. It's not a defense strategy. It's a, it's a gospel strategy. And he presents a gospel strategy because of this thing, and this is what I want us to see, that as a moral outlaw, Paul has a mindset of hope and judgment. Paul has a mindset of hope and judgment. I think that can be a, a harsh thought for Christians and non-Christians alike. You're, he has a hope that the judgment's coming? He has a hope in punishment? That seems mean. We believe that? It seems sadistic. And I want us to know that our hope, when we talk about the hope of judgment, we're not talking about hope and punishment but we're talking about a day when true justice will be seen. We're talking about a, a day when, when God will not only account for sin, but he will reckon with sin. It'll be a day we will be able to sin no more. We'll be able to offend God no more. We have to start with the idea of sin primarily being a, an offense against God and secondarily being offense against against the human victim. God is the one who is primarily offended in all sin, whether it's a little bitty sin or a great big sin. Regardless of who the sin is perpetrated against, God is the primary one who is offended. And this isn't to minimize the offense to the victim of sin. People who are, who are taken in human trafficking and their bodies are sold, that is an awful offense to them. Mothers of murdered children, it is an awful offense. Wives of philandering husbands, it's an awful offense. I am not minimizing the offense to the human victim. I'm maximizing the offense to God that sin is and all sin. So our hope in the judgment is a hope that in that day God will reckon with sin and that his glory will be seen in his holy justice. True justice will only be seen in that last day, and that's, that's Paul's hope. That's our hope, isn't it? Our hope is not in the courts of man or in our marketplaces or in our schools. Our hopes aren't in the institution of man, but our hope's in Christ. Our hope's in a day when there will be no more sin, there will be no more pain, there will be no more tears. When God is glorified in his justice, that is our hope, that is Paul's mind frame, his mindset as a moral outlaw. As a moral outlaw, he orients himself to this world on a hope of justice. But like so many things in Christianity, we don't want things just to be mindsets. They do little good for our lives if it just stays in our minds. So we want to see how this hope of judgment bears itself out in our lives as the church. What does it look like to live life with the hope of judgment? And I think we'll see that as we, we move into the verdict. So we've, we've had the prosecution's case and charges have been levied against Paul and he's made his defense pointing people primarily to Christ and and now we come to the verdict where Felix has his opportunity to present justice. Verse 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. 
When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he is hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Fiat justitia. It's a Latin phrase used in Roman courts. I don't know when it began. I don't know if it was actually being used in the first century or not, but it's it's a Latin phrase that basically means let justice be done. It's pretty clear as we read this account of Paul's trial that justice is not done. What would you do if you were Paul and justice was not done? I would lose my mind. I think many of us would. Maybe I don't have a mindset of what it looks like to live as a moral outlight with the hope of judgment, but I would be protesting. Paul doesn't protest. I think we see how Paul responds to his injustice. We see how the hope of judgment is bearing itself out in his life. And, and the first thing I see is that the hope of, of judgment frees him as a moral outlaw to prioritize others. The hope of judgment frees him to loosen his grip on his rights. What's remarkably missing from this text, and it's always dangerous to preach what's not in the text, but I couldn't help but notice that Paul never once brings up the injustice of Felix, who he spoke to for two years after this day. He never points out that he's innocent. He never points out that he should be free to go. He never points out that that Felix is doing him a wrong. Instead, he simply preaches the gospel. He preaches faith in Christ. Would you? Would I? I don't want to make it sound like like it's wrong to, to want justice. I think I think God disdains the fact that Felix is holding him in prison. I think God disdains the fact that the Jews have falsely accused him. So it's not wrong for us in light of that to to want justice, but, but what Paul has done is he's prioritized, he's prioritized Felix's eternal fate over his own justice. As moral outlaws, will we be prepared to prioritize the fate, the eternal fate of those opposing us over our own rights? Do we now, and and I'm not saying our rights are wrong, and sometimes our staying up for rights are staying up for things that God deeply desires and believes in. But are those things that we're standing up for keeping us from presenting a winsome gospel? Is standing up for our rights or, or standing up for good things keeping us from having a door to share the gospel with someone else? Is the way that we handle the abortion debate, is that preventing us from having a winsome presentation of the gospel? Abortion is an awful thing. I'm not suggesting that we don't stand up for the abolition of it, but Is it keeping us from having a winsome presentation of the gospel? How about our stand on on same-sex marriage? Are we we saying that so much that we're losing the chance to to, to preach the gospel? What about your own rights and your own lives? I think of of Richard, who I mentioned earlier. I think this is a good example. If you just look at Richard, who was fired from this New York City firm, 
for being an evangelical Christian. He had every right in the world to go and bring the courts involved and to attack and to a fight. And he made a very calculated decision that it would be best for the gospel for him not to fight for those rights. For him to go on good terms. Are we prepared as moral outlaws to sacrifice our rights for an opportunity to share the gospel with others, prioritizing their souls over our rights? Moral outlaws are free to consider others first. I think here's another place where moral outlaws are free. Moral outlaws are free to preach a robust and complete gospel. Moral outlaws are free to preach a robust and complete gospel. Look at what Paul preaches. Verse 24. He spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. He's speaking to the one who has the authority to release him. And he's speaking what majority culture would find the most offensive pieces of the gospel. How often do we present the gospel as very thin and narrow because we have the fear of man to the one we are preaching it to? I find it much easier to preach grace and adoption, salvation, to preach the love of God and the love of Christ. I find it far easier to preach those things than to preach sin and self-control and righteousness and judgment. I'm not suggesting we don't preach grace. I'm suggesting sometimes we don't preach sin because we're afraid. I think sometimes we prioritize the judgment of the one we're preaching to of us over and above the judgment of God on that person. We allow a thin gospel to be preached because we're afraid of what that person might judge on us. As we continue to become moral outlaws, more and more people are going to find a robust and complete gospel offensive. But we know that our justice comes in the final day, and we know that their justice comes in the final day, so we are free to preach to them a convincing gospel a robust gospel, complete gospel. And, and I should probably let you know about this, about Felix. An interesting backstory to this. If you want to learn more about Felix, go read Josephus' Antiquities. I believe you can read about him in Book 20. But, but here's what we know about uh, Felix. Felix and Drusilla were not married. Drusilla was married to another man. And Felix saw her and decided that he wanted her, so he went and wooed her, and she divorced the other man and went and married Felix. We have to think that this is the background that Paul has in mind as he preaches self-control and righteousness and judgment to Felix. He's taking Felix's eternal fate very seriously. We have to think that this is the background that makes Felix afraid. He says, that's enough. No more. Are we willing to let the gospel make people afraid? Lest I be accused of preaching a thin gospel, let me say something briefly to those of you who may not yet believe in Christ. I hope you're hearing today that Sin is real. That everyone sitting in this room is a sinner in desperate need of forgiveness and grace. I hope you're hearing that a judgment is coming where we will all stand before a holy God. I hope you hear that there will be those declared righteous and those declared wicked on that day.
And most importantly, I hope you're hearing Christ. We can't look. We can't look. If you step back and look at this whole text together, we can't look at this trial scene and not see echoes of a greater trial that happened before. We can't see echoes of the trial of a greater moral outlaw. Before this trial happened here, before Felix, there was another trial where a moral outlaw was charged by the Jews, and that moral outlaw, too, was charged with inciting rebellion. That moral outlaw, too, was innocent. That moral outlaw, too, became before the Romans. The Romans, in that trial as well, failed to issue justice. That moral outlaw was Christ. That moral outlaw was the Son of God. And instead of fighting for his rights, instead of fighting for his justice, that moral outlaw went to the cross. And he was hung there so that the punishment that was due to us who believe, that was supposed to be reckoned to us on the day of judgment, would be counted righteous. He is the moral outlaw who raised from the dead. He is the moral outlaw that reigns. He is the moral outlaw that will judge us. He's the moral outlaw that allows us to live on in eternity with our God. That's the message. I don't know what will happen in America. I don't know what will happen in the Middle East. I don't know what it will look like to be a moral outlaw. But I know that's the message. I know that's a message worth rejoicing in. I know that's a message worth finding our hope in. I know that's a message worth preaching in the hardest and most difficult of circumstances. I would posit it's even a message worth dying for. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we stand amazed by the rights that Christ forfeited to go to the cross for us. God, we stand amazed that we will stand before you in judgment and that we will declare it righteous because that we are in Christ. Lord, I pray for this church, for every Christian in here, that we would have the reality of the hope of judgment in us. Lord, that we would live in light of that, that our lives would bear the truth that we believe, that that your great justice will be had. Lord, I pray for those in here, Lord, who don't call you Lord, who don't call you Savior. Lord, I pray that they would hear judgment preached and they would have fear, but they would be unlike Felix and that they would repent. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that that your church would be glorified in in a culture and in a land that moves away from you. God, be glorified in your people. Be glorified here. God, we, we trust in your moral outlaw, your son, Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen.